very grateful, we are very grateful for uh, IKEA for supporting this session. We've heard a great deal, I think, over the last several days about the importance of storytelling in terms of bringing, making real um, so many of the initiatives that are happening around the climate challenge. And we have a glittering panel of multi-award winning journalists who are going to discuss this, led by the fabulous Whitney Richardson. So please give them a very big round of applause. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us here today. My name is Whitney Richardson, and I am the International Events Manager at the New York Times, based in London. Um, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today, but I should say thank you to the trees because it is their conference. We are the spectators in this space. So thank you for the trees for allowing us to have this important conversation today. Um, this week, as we know, the United Nations Climate Conference enters their second week of negotiations with world leaders from around 197 countries knuckling down to finalize a new agreement to tackle global warming. We're trying to resolve big issues around money, around transparency, as well as timelines to reach net zero. This gathering makes clear that this is a global issue at stake. Um, and this is why the New York Times and many global news organizations are investing a lot in covering this crisis. Um, but local residents uh, are also the primary stakeholders in the use, the care, and the health of their ecosystems and the natural resources embedded in them. So we know that local stakeholders have knowledge and interest that global media organizations simply do not have. The question we will explore today with my incredible panelists is what is the interrelationship between local players and global players when we think about journalism? And, and how can these two sectors work together to showcase solutions, the problems, and the future of what climate change is to be. We will have roughly 30 minutes for our conversation. I will open the floor 10 minutes to hear from you all to ask our distinguished speakers some questions. Um, and we will go from there. So introducing you to our incredible panel today, um, we have Ruth McLean, who is joining us virtually. Hello, Ruth. Hi. Hi, Whitney. Hi, everyone. Ruth is the West Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times, based in Senegal, one of my favorite countries and cities. Um, she joined the Times in 2019 after three and a half years of covering West Africa for The Guardian. Ruth, I'm going to ask you a rapid fire question, and all of the speakers a rapid fire question as I introduce you. Keep it brief. What is the one location everyone should visit for its stunning beauty? Oh, um, off the top of my head. The Congo Basin. I just got back. It's really stunning. You should all go. It's not the easiest place to get to, but it's my recommendation. The Congo Basin. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for that. Jeffrey Gettleman, a winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 2012 for international reporting, was most recently the Times' South Asia Bureau Chief based in New Delhi and is now an international correspondent based in London. I hope to have coffee with you when we get back to London. Um, he was also previously the East Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times for many years in Kenya. And also, if you haven't read his book, Love Africa, please do so. Jeffrey, your rapid fire question. Who is the one person that inspired you to become an international correspondent? Whoa. Um, <laughs> can I answer hers? Because I'd say Congo too. Um, it's a long story, but I had the good fortune to meet a young guy named Dan Eldon, who was a very inspirational uh, person. And at the age of 1920, he led this mission to bring uh, supplies to refugees in Malawi. And he was later killed in Somalia in 1993. Um, 
and he was a, a young guy living his passion and trying to do good and have fun while he was doing it. And that's kind of been my, my, my hope to live up to that. Thank you for that, that's amazing. Mark Schuppenstein, uh, joining us virtually. Mark, are you in New Orleans, Louisiana right now? Uh, I'm in Metairie, which is a suburban uh, uh, community of New Orleans. Fantastic, thank you for joining us. Mark is an environment reporter for the Times-Picune in New Orleans, Louisiana, and his stories on Hurricane Katrina were part of the Times-Picune Stories awarded in 2006 Pulitzer Prizes for public service and breaking news reporting. Mark, your question is, if someone visited New Orleans for the first time, what is the first place outdoor that you would send them? Um, the riverfront uh, down uh, at the bottom of Canal Street to uh, see that uh, New Orleans is a thriving port city uh, uh, and also uh, that area overlooks the French Quarter, so they see the rich history of the city as well. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Donald Martin, currently the editor-in-chief of The Herald here in Glasgow, which I learned today is the oldest national paper in the world, over 200 years old. Incredible, even older than The New York Times, which is 170 years old. Um, Donald is the editor-in-chief and with more than 30 years of experience editing national, regional, Sunday and daily weekly titles across the UK, um, it's incredible to have you here with us. Your question is, what is one word to describe the spirit of Glasgow? Cool. <laughs> it is cool, and you mean that in the spirit <laughs> of... In the spirit of it, of course. I uh, would use the word Gallus, which means it's a brilliant, vibrant city, but Gallus is a very Scottish word. I love it. And, and thank you, Glasgow, for having us, having us here. Um, Matt Thompson. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, Whitney. Doing well, thank you. Matt is the editor of Headway at the New York Times, a new journalism initiative to investigate global and national challenges, which will cover a range of economic, social, health, infrastructural, and environmental challenges. Matt, your question, what is the one character trait you think all journalists should carry? Curiosity. I mean, I think um, we are called to discover what is happening in the world and to share it widely. And I think having a broad, open, wide, avid, deep curiosity is the only way to do that well. Curiosity, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And last but certainly not least, Mark Landler. Uh, Mark is the London Bureau Chief of the New York Times. In his 27 years at the Times, he has been Bureau Chief in Hong Kong and in Frankfurt a White House correspondent, diplomatic correspondent, European economic correspondent, and a business reporter in New York. So impressive, Mark. Your question is, if everyone attending COP could read one book based on your recommendation, what book would that be? Um, maybe uh, Sapiens by Yuval Hariri. That's a great pick. And you've all, as I understand, will be here tomorrow speaking with Sumini Sengupta and Vanessa Nakate. Um, so if you haven't read his book, I do recommend Sapiens is a good one. So jumping right in, these questions are going to be for Ruth and Jeffrey. Um, we know that representation of the Global South has been a big area of focus this week on the COP agenda, as well as many conversations that have taken place right here in the Climate Hub. In India, we know that floods and heat, lack of water and wildfires could diminish productivity. In Nigeria, high risk climate hazards include wildfires, heat, sea levels and water stress. How have you both worked with local journalists on the ground in Africa and in India to document the impacts of climate change? And what role do you guys see local journalists playing in your daily reporting? And we can start with you, Jeffrey, and then go to Ruth. Sure. <clears throat> um, our job, if we're doing it right, is to tell stories that make people care. It, it's one thing to inform, it's one thing to explain, but 
to really have a powerful story that moves people, you have to make them care. And <clears throat> if we're doing our jobs well, I feel like we're generating empathy. We're in the empathy generation business. It's, it's really important. I like doing human interest stories about people, often people in crisis. I did a lot of that in Africa. I've done a lot of that in India. Um, and to make somebody really care about what's happening in South Sudan, or let's say the bad air quality in New Delhi, uh, or caste issues in India, you, you have to develop it around a character that's a very um, traditional device, but you have to write it with emotion. You have to write it in a way that the people reading it aren't just gonna find it interesting, but are gonna care about your subjects. With environment, that's a little harder because a lot of these issues are drier and they're more scientific and they're more complicated. But I think we can do the same thing, that we can try to generate empathy for either the people who are suffering the effects of climate change or the environment itself. Um, how, you have you, how have you worked with journalists on the ground then to get that empathy and to you know, connect the dots for people that are reading the New York Times in their homes? So our operations around the world are a hybrid of people like me and local journalists. There's not, there's not a wall, like in, in the India office, we have more Indian journalists than outsiders. And we work really closely together. Like none of the work is possible without that coordination. And one thing that I did when I came into New Delhi was really try to emphasize their participation, to, to share more bylines, to help train the, the Indian journalists how to write their own stories. Um, I enjoy doing that. Like, I've been doing this for a while, and I really enjoyed sharing a lot of the experience that I've had. But it's also this, like, really magical partnership when you take somebody from the outside who sees a place very differently, often not with the depth or knowledge, but with a lot of curiosity, as, as you know, one of our panelists said. And you team that up with somebody who knows the subjects really well and speaks the language and knows the culture. That's when you get amazing results. And that's been a lot of what we've done in India. And as Ruth will, will you know, second this, I'm sure, that's how she works in West Africa. That's how a lot of us work. It's not like a foreigner and a local. It's a combination of people who work for the New York Times from different perspectives. And Ruth, would you agree with Jeffrey there? And do you have an example of that in practical action where you did a story where you partnered up with a journalist who was on the ground, had local expertise, and it ended up in a story that really made impact. Uh, I mean, I feel like it happens over and over again, yes. Um, I, I cover about 25 countries in Western Central Africa. Um, you know, that's an incredibly diverse um, range of countries, languages, people, histories, contexts understand. So my job would be completely impossible um, without journalists in each of those countries who, you know, I wouldn't necessarily just call local journalists. Often they're very much international journalists too. Um, you know, like journalists I work with, for example, in, in northern Nigeria who have, you know, an incredibly detailed understanding of the interplay between the different countries in that region, like Niger and Cameroon and, and Chad. Um, so, yes, um, I think it's a collaboration. It, it has to be um, always. Um, I mean, you know, Congo is, is on my mind because I was most recently there. Um, and in Congo on this trip, I worked with uh, a journalist who I've often worked with, um, a guy called Caleb Kabanda. And we were in the Congo basin looking at the peatlands there and the, the rainforests. Um, and, you know, my work would have been impossible without him and without other people helping me on the ground, you know, f helping me find the, the right people to talk to or, you know, some of the right people to talk to, helping me communicate with them, helping me even know what questions to ask and how exactly, you know, in a, in a specific cultural context. Um, and, you know, I think on this trip, it was especially interesting because Caleb has been working for many years with, with many journalists, I think, um, including Jeff. Um, and, you know, often the stories in Congo that people come to report are not, not the happiest ones. Um, and so he's got a new project 
and hence a new lens through which he's, he's seeing things. His new project is a documentary called The Congo We Want. Um, and he's, you know, on every trip that he does now, he's going around asking that question of people. What does the Congo you want look like? Um, and I found that a really interesting, positive, and very different um, way of approaching a story and, and really helpful for my, for my own reporting. Thank you for that. Um, I know the, the peatlands is one story that is a theme that I know Donald is also thinking a lot about here in Glasgow and across Scotland, um, which we can talk about as well. Um, Mark, from where you're sitting in uh, Louisiana, I know in 2018, the Times partnered with the Times Picune of New Orleans to publish an ambitious three-part special report about the ecological crisis facing Louisiana's vanishing coast and the people who live there. Um, at a time of intense financial pressure on local news coverage, it was reasoned at that time that both readers uh, would benefit from both publications partnering up, one with the long expertise of the Times Picune um, on that issue, but also with the resources and skills that the New York Times could provide via reporting, our visual journalism, our data, our graphics. Um, at, at a practical level, because you've done a partnership that, that worked from where I'm sitting, how did that partnership come together and what were the lasting impacts from that joint reporting project that we can learn from both at a local level and at a global level? So um, it, the way it actually came about was that uh, Dean Beck Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the New York Times, gave a talk at Neiman in which uh, he sort of offhandedly said that national newspapers needed to do a better job of pairing with local uh, news organizations to, to, to do more coverage of important issues you know, of national import. Um, and someone uh, from uh, the owner of our, of our paper at that time, Advanced Publications, uh, contacted him and said, well, um, put up or shut up. Uh, we want to uh, go in with you, and uh, we think we have some good ideas for doing that. So we ended up sitting down uh, with Dean and uh, senior editors at, at uh, the New York Times to talk about what are the major issues for South Louisiana, and it largely is uh, climate change and sea level rise and what its effects will be on small communities that live outside of major levees that were rebuilt after Hurricane Katrina and the future of those major levees that have been rebuilt. And uh, uh, we ended up teaming uh, my team, which is uh, a grant funded uh, reporters uh, with uh, the team of uh, two reporters from the New York Times and uh, a, 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 a freelance photographer uh, to put together um, this package uh, that ended up being a special section that appeared in both the New York Times and our paper on the same Sunday. And uh, it, it was a good, good start. We've, we've continued to do those sorts of things uh, to this day. I've got a meeting later today with the local media associates uh, team looking at climate um, and uh, uh, we're all working on stories around the country on uh, climate issues that we're sharing amongst our papers. Uh, and we're also uh, pairing with ProPublica on uh, uh, other long-term uh, investigative uh, reporting projects involving climate. What would you say was the biggest learning for you uh, with that initiative um, going into these new partnerships? What worked, what didn't? Um, well, um, uh, having to recognize that you're going to get big footed by the big guys, uh, but uh, figuring out ways of making sure that your, your ideas uh, still are extremely important in, in uh, what ends up being produced. Um, uh, it turned out that I ended up being uh, the encyclopedia for, uh, for the, the, the team. And, uh, and one of my stories ended up being the, the, the second main story. Uh, so it, it turned out to be a, a, a pretty good uh, a pairing of, of large and small. That's fantastic. Um, Donald, I know that at the Herald, um, 
you've also experienced, you're also experiencing pressure, right, uh, from, a, from a financial and from a resource perspective on investing in big, ambitious pieces. That is, that is, that is something that is, that has to be recognized, that's that big, big stories take resources. Um, how are you managing that with your team? I know there's, everyone has all eyes on Glasgow, on Scotland. Um, you're the big paper in town. Uh, how has that been for you as the, as the head of the paper and having to manage both the business decisions but also wanting to get these important stories out? It's tough, I'll be honest. And I'm delighted that we've got collaboration with partners like the New York Times and others is the only way that we can truly provide in-depth analysis and true insight. It takes time, as you'll know, to produce brilliant journalism. And if you're producing your papers every day and your resources are used up just producing that, it's hard to then take somebody out of that equation and do something else. Investigative, I've just done a piece where we went with outside collaborators into how green is Scotland. But that would be a team looking at it for three months to produce one week of work. I can't, with my limited team, go and ask them to do that because I wouldn't simply get the paper out. So partnerships and collaboration has been the way that we can actually add some rich content to what we currently produce. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Um, what have you seen in the evolution of these issues locally that maybe a new journalist on the scene might, might miss? Well, we have been reporting on peatlands and wind farms for quite some time, but I'll be honest, I don't think it has truly resonated until COP26. Suddenly, there's greater focus on what's happening, what the solutions are, what the challenges are and the issues. What we provide when we work with the New York Times, and we are doing so on peatlands, is that local context, that local richness of knowledge. You know, even if it's just down to geography, the flow country, which stores so much of our carbon emissions in the peatlands, and talking about little issues there from the challenges of where we were putting wind farms in. Wind farms are green, but that involves concrete roads. That's releasing all these emissions from the peatlands, and it's that balance. And the fights between locals who are seeing investment in an area, and others are saying, well, you need to protect an area of outstanding beauty, but also really important for carbon capture. So it's context. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's one that I, 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 do, I guess I wonder, like, how do we bring visibility to that? How do we bring awareness to some of these issues that are very particular to where you are um, and allowing global journalists as they come in to, to understand these very particular issues have sensitivities and cultural sensitivities. It's a, that's a very interesting challenge. Um, Matt, over to you. Uh, I know you're leading a team dedicated to covering challenges like climate change through the lens of progress. Um, there's a widespread consensus that we just simply aren't making close to enough progress to head off a catastrophic climate catastrophe. Uh, how do you approach coverage of the climate with that lens? And what role do local organizations play in the vision for you? Yeah. Inherent in the definition of progress is this inexorable force, the forward motion of time. And so that's how we're approaching um, covering the world. We're looking at the full range. Headway is about understanding the full range of possible futures. We're trying to understand not just what trajectory we're on, but what is the range of possible trajectories? What are the forces that will affect how this all plays out? What is our power to shape those trajectories collectively? Um, I, I think the version of the future in which humankind is able to contain warning to a, a level that is consistent with continued human thriving on the planet, how we are able to do that is a fascinating story. And I want to be at the front 
on the front row of watching that story unfold, if that is the future that we inhabit. Um, but regardless of the way that this turns out, I think what our opportunity is, is to pay attention over time to what is changing and what has the capacity to change. Um, I love the um, the lens that, um, that Ruth mentioned um, of Caleb's project, The Congo We Want, because um, I think um, you know, when you talk to people who explore futures, um, one of the frameworks that they use to contain what r range of possible futures people imagine is to ask not just what do you fear, but what do you hope and what do you expect? Um, and try to understand what, what it would take um, to bring about the future that lies within people's hopes. Trying to understand that, I think, is um, is an important journalistic task as well as sounding a warning about everything that's happening in the world. I'm really excited to see what you guys do with Headway. Um, when can we expect to see some of the first stories rolling out um, so that people can start looking out for them? In just a few weeks, we'll be releasing, we'll be launching the oh, our first project. Um, it's kind of um, what um, what Michael Kimmelman, our editor at large, and the Times' as chief architecture critic, calls an emus bouche for the the coverage that's to come. So Ruth has been in Congo reporting a story that we've been working together on, which I am absolutely enthralled by and cannot wait to see. So that will be, um, and uh, that will not be in a few weeks. We've still got to put some time into <laughs> that story, to bringing that story to the public in the, in the fullest possible airing. But in the meantime, um, to tackle this lens of progress, part of what we've done is to ask, what can we learn from hindsight? Um, so we've taken all of these forecasts, all of these projections for things that were expected to happen by 2020 and 2021, and asking what happened and what can we learn from it. Um, and sometimes that leads us to surprising places, or at least interesting, curious places, to, um, to, <laughs> to, to call back to my earlier answer. Um, we looked, for example, at the time that a major emitter met a climate target. <laughs> when the EU um, pledged to contain um, its emissions to 20% of 1990 levels and then did. But then it's important not, of course, to just look at the indicators, but to look at what do those indicators mean? What goes into them? When we say net zero emissions, what is involved in that calculation? How are we accounting for our emissions? Um, and um, how is it that cutting down forests, shipping them across the Atlantic Ocean, and then burning them for fuel and coal-fired power plants counts as a carbon neutral renewable energy source. Those are the types of questions that I think we're led to when we look at how are we actually pacing on our biggest, biggest challenges. Big questions, um, and I look forward to big reports coming from your team. Um, Mark, as a London Bureau Chief, you're very much focused on London, the UK. Um, and we, we know that rising sea levels is one of the, the potential dangers of, of what climate change will have on the United Kingdom particularly. Um, as a reporter who's been at the Times for now almost three decades, how do you think your coverage is going to evolve uh, with the risk of climate change as it, as it accelerates? Um, and how do you envision working with journalists across the UK to tell these stories in a more robust way? Well, I think to answer that question, it's probably helpful to go back a little bit and look at how the climate story has evolved over time. Um, and it's a story that sort of began very much in the scientific arena. Um, the first people that really covered climate were, you know, talking to scientists, environmental experts, um, and it really resided in the science pages of the paper because it was very much a um, a future threat. Um, then it slowly became a political and a business story. The first time I sort of intersected writing about climate was more from the perspective of, um, you know, the earliest days of the renewable energy industry and what oh. was driving the economics of, of windmills or solar power. I was based in Germany at the time, and Germany was an early pioneer of some of these technologies. Uh, and I remember going to a renewable energy summit in Bonn uh, something like 15 or 17 years ago. But again, it was still mainly the province of 
business writers and science writers. And the stories I wrote ran in our business section. Um, then over time, as it's become more of an existential threat, um, the story has really come to occupy the center of what any of us do as journalists. So, for example, when I covered the White House uh, and we did a, a, a series of stories on the legacy of Barack Obama and his presidency, um, the only subject he gave us an interview on, he turned us down for every interview except on climate and what he had done in the realm of climate policy. Um, and I remember we flew to uh, Hawaii and interviewed him on a marine base in Oahu with the waves crashing on the rocks below the, uh, the building we were, we were meeting in. Um, and it was actually an early effort to do a multimedia package. We, we, had a, a, you know, we had a videotaped interview with the president and a big article that ran with it. Um, and so by then it was already coming to occupy the, the center of what political journalists do for a living. Um, but I would argue in the last decade, um, it's, it's actually evolved even more so that it's now not just a political story um, and an environmental and science story, but it's also um, a cultural story. Absolutely. Um, you know, we spent a week in, in um, Glasgow and saw sort of the, the cultural side of the debate over climate and the fact that some of the most compelling voices in this debate are now in the sphere of music and arts and the people who created this room. Um, so I think that now if you're a culture reporter, climate is a big story for you, political reporter, business reporter, science reporter. And lastly and sadly, um, and Mark knows this side of it all too well, um, you know, there's a uh, breaking news element to it because natural disasters, many of which are aggravated by climate change, um, have come to consume more and more of our, uh, of all our news organizations' resources. So, um, if it's you know Hurricane Katrina or wildfires, um, you know those are now a huge financial uh, you know commitment for our newspapers to cover properly, put them in the right context, and um, and you know and lastly, I'll just say, the kind of work that Matt is doing at Headway and what Ruth is doing in Congo and what Jeff is talking about is also a very important reminder that the stories that are really gonna break through are the ones that are about people and make the story personal um, and remove it from the realm of um, 2.5 degrees centigrade or uh, you know, is Biden's bill gonna pass Congress? And that's what we really need to remember as journalists all the time, but I think since it's so central to what we do, we're not gonna forget that anymore. It's true, and I think Jeffrey touched on that when we first started talking. Um, speaking of Hurricane Katrina, um, Donald, I'm, Mark, I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that uh, when Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina hit, I, I very clearly remember many journalists went down to cover it. Um, it was one of the biggest catastrophes that we'd seen. Um, I think it was one of the first real climate emergencies that America had, had witnessed um, on a local but on a global level as well. We, it, was, it was covered by media organizations all over the world. What was that experience like being at the Times-Picune, being at the head of the Times-Picune, and, and all of these global media organizations descending in your town to cover that story? Uh, give us a little a flavor of what that experience was like at that time. Well, you have to remember that 40% um, of our staff lost their homes during Katrina. It, it really, you know, <laughs> we, we had to evacuate our own building. Uh, we had to relocate our, our newsroom in another city. Uh, it, it, was, it was a zoo. Uh, by the time things uh, settled down, though, uh, we, we had to take on a role of having to correct national media um, uh, about uh, uh, key issues like uh, what is the future of New Orleans and should the city be saved? Uh, we actually had to, to go and get um, um, uh, some reporters from other organizations and, and lecture them about why the, the, the levy system that was being rebuilt actually was the proper thing to do on the same footprint that it was before Katrina. Those, those are the kinds of issues that, that we're always having to face. We're facing that same issue today where the, the town that we uh, focused on for the, for the uh, joint project, uh, John Lafitte, was decimated 
uh, by Hurricane Ida this summer uh, on the 16th anniversary of uh, Hurricane Katrina. And uh, the same question that we were asking uh, as part of that series, do you know how, how do we make a decision on whether or not these small communities outside major levy systems exist is still there there the state is going to be sitting down with the army corps of engineers to determine whether or not it's financially feasible to save this community and uh, those are things that uh, the united states and across the world are going to have to be looking at repeatedly as uh, climate change causes sea level rise and uh, rainfall and other issues that are, are gonna change, changing the world. And it's changing it now. Thank you for that, Mark. And my final question before I hand it over to you audience members is gonna be for you, Donald. Um, as journalists pack up their bags and head home, uh, what stories do you want them to be focusing on, particularly on, on Glasgow, Scotland, uh, when they get back to their desk around the climate story, what, what, what lasting legacy do you want reporters to leave with? Well, I think it's about holding politicians and businesses to account for either at Scottish level or a UK level. But personally, I'd like to see more exposure around the peatlands in Scotland and their value to this planet. And because when we have global exposure. What it does is put pressure on people locally to make sure that we do protect them. And for those of you who don't know what peatlands are, you gave me a great explanation in the back, if you could summarize it in a sentence. Oh, good grief. Um, so when <laughs> plants die, they release their um, carbon monoxide, but they don't die in the peatlands, they decay. So they get captured into the ground and in some of the areas up in the north of Scotland, you can have peatlands that are about 10 metres deep. And they ca they've captured phenomenal amounts of uh, CO2 emissions, so carbon. So the stories to take away for the journalists in the room, peatlands, awareness, and for politicians to just keep an eye on Scotland. So if you have questions for our panelists, I'm now going to hand it to you. Hi there, thank you very much for that. Um, when you're working with politicians, there's always the need to get the, the information from behind the scenes. You need to speak to them. So when you call them out in a newspaper, they suddenly lose interest in maybe speaking to you. How do you balance that problem of getting to the politicians and hearing from them directly like Obama and calling them out when Obama failed to do something when it comes to climate? What's, what's your approach to that, that tension? Uh, well, we, we try to do both. Um, and, uh, you know, it helps to be the New York Times, candidly, because uh, even when you make a politician angry or call them out, uh, if you're President Obama, you, you, you can't afford to completely stop talking to us. Um, that's one of the basic tensions that, that all of us face, um, you know, so, some more than others. I think what Ruth and Jeff do is a little bit different than being a Washington reporter where you do develop these ongoing relationships with elected officials. But, you know, I found in my career, honestly, that um, if, you, uh, y if you hit a source with a two by four once or twice and you're doing it honestly and with the facts on your side, it can actually lead to you having a better long-term relationship because uh, they don't assume you're a patsy, they don't assume that you can be played. Uh, and it, it can actually end up being a more rewarding relationship. And I honestly would put the president, uh, the former president, in that category. He had a good, respectful relationship with us even after we wrote plenty of things that criticized him along the way. Can I just add, it's probably uh, at times not as healthy here in Scotland um, because they probably challenge media when they call them out saying that we've got it wrong. Um, when we haven't, and I think one message is the value of great journalism. You know, just put it in the context, there are 50 spin doctors or press officers 
working for the Scottish Government, whose job it is, is to portray that message in the most positive of lights for the Scottish Government and to suppress information they don't want us to know. And yet I have three political journalists in Holyrood. That's the balance that we face. But all of us here as journalists are trying to get to the truth. And I think people need to understand the value of what we produce, because we aren't trying to get it wrong, we're trying to get it right. Excellent. Question here. Uh, hello. Uh, my question would be, when it comes to reporting in environmental issues, I've seen on both sides of the spectrum where we have people complaining that uh, environmental journalism is done in too extremist of a way, or people are saying you're reporting as if the climate is already destroyed, that things are already over, and people say it's not effective. On the other hand, we hear people saying that when you report just facts about what's going on, it's not engaging, it's not interesting, it's not getting the attention that the climate deserves. So my question would be is how do you balance that dichotomy and make it a fair way that engages the audience without going to extreme ends where it's too biased? Anybody want to take that question? And maybe... Uh, I, yeah, I think, I think we want to try to tell stories. Yeah. Like our, when we're doing our jobs well, like I was saying in the beginning, we're making people care. And we're doing that by telling stories. Um, journalism is an interesting blend. Like part of us are investigators, part of us are critics of, of politics or of music. You know, we're interested in certain subjects or sports. But a big core bit of what we do is telling a story and, and figuring out a way to reach people with the right language, with the right rhythms of the words we choose, um, the structure of the story. So I think with the environment, it's harder because it's complicated. And the best way is to root the story in something very real, something very concrete, something that's happening now. Because so much of this talk, this talk is about what's going to come. And, you know, part of us, we don't know, right? But, but it's just finding something now that's really changing people's lives. And it's the equivalent of grabbing them by the shoulders and trying to wake them up. And I think when we're doing our jobs well, that's what we're doing. Absolutely. We have a question here by Stephen Dunbar Johnson. I'm probably not allowed to ask a question, but I can't resist. Um, Donald and Mark, I'm really interested in this tension between um, the, the pressure on resources that you've articulated so well, particularly you, Donald, and the need to do deep journalism and to do the storytelling and the cost that takes. So how, my question is, how proactive are you both? Mark, you talked about sort of serendipitous meeting with Dean McBain, Barquet and then moving forward with that. But how now, how proactive are you working with larger organizations like the New, New York Times and others in act actually collaborating? Is it a proactive process? Um, yeah, it is. It, it really is. And in fact, uh, uh, we were about halfway through the project when uh, um, I, I think it was Dean himself who woke up and said, well, you know, we really need to address the question of New Orleans viability. Mark, what do you need to do about that? And uh, I ended up going back and working with John and, and saying, hey, yeah, we need to, to take another look at whether or not uh, the city can survive in the future with the existing levy system. Those, those are, you know, that kind of uh, thinking process is something we were able to do with the New York Times. It's something that's happening nationwide through organizations uh, in the United States, like uh, the Society of Environmental Journalists, uh, where uh, we have annual uh, conferences, uh, last two years online, uh, where we're discussing what are the key issues and how, how to address them. And, um, and there are, are these grant funders that are helping us out by uh, throwing money at us and saying, go find the stories and do it. Um, and we end up working with our editors to, to do that. It's, it's a difficult process. Uh, and unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, uh, journalism deserts across the United States right now that are not uh, uh, being uh, uh, given those those kinds of opportunities but um, uh, it, it's something that you know I'm hoping that we'll be able to expand over time 
That's my number one well, focus, Stephen. Um, I think probably spent the last year to 18 months, maybe a bit longer, trying to find people who partner with us. And I think there's a slow realization that people can't do on their own. I've done investigations with my rival newspapers, if you like, the Scotsman, the Press and Journal, the Courier, STV, where we pulled together a reporter from each. To come together, we're looking at things with other UK national titles, colleges, academia. I've got to tap into that resource. Well, we are at time. Um, can we take one more question? Is it on? Okay, hello. Stand up. Okay, maybe remove my mask. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Nika. I'm so excited to ask you this question. So um, I have been connected to a lot of black, indigenous, and communities of color who are oftentimes alienated from the environmental movement and are actually, oftentimes the climate movement is made um, inaccessible. And you all have been expressing journalists as being these deliverers of truth. So my question is kind of twofold. The first one is, how are journalists at really um, working to create stories that are more accessible to these communities and relevant to these communities because they are often um, on the forefront of environmental catastrophes? And then also, how are journalistic organizations working to create more diversity within, their within the journalists, given that it is people of these communities that can best communicate to, to people of those communities as as we know our own truths. And um, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you very much. Great question. Ruth, do you want to? Sure. Applause from the audience. I, I, Go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I love that question. Um, and I don't know that I have a, you know, a, a, a very good answer. But um, just to, to say that, you know, wherever I'm reporting, I. I'm working with journalists and I wish that they could go to Europe, go to the States and do the same kind of reporting on those countries um, back to, you know, the Congo or Nigeria or wherever I'm working that I'm doing. Um, you know, I, I wish it was more of a, a two-way street. Um, and I, I wish that, you know, there were structures that enabled that because there are really important um, stories to be told in the other direction too. Um, I mean, you know, as Jeff was saying earlier in my own journalism, in our journalism at the Times, I think it's really important to collaborate um, with journalists from the communities that we're, we're writing about um, and to, you know, show their work and value that work. I think in the past, often that work has gone totally undervalued. Um, and I think, um, you know, as I said earlier, their perspectives um, are completely necessary to the, the product that I, in the end, at least, um, produce. So I think it's a really um, important question. Thank you. Um, and Mark, I'll get to Mark and Donald. Mark, go. I okay. Okay, so uh, my newsroom is in the midst of uh, attempting to expand uh, its look, what it looks like to make it more uh, visible uh, based on what our community looks like. Um, and, and it's a difficult process uh, because uh, it's difficult finding uh, uh, reporters to take positions in smaller newspapers. Uh, that's one of the key issues, but we're trying to work on it. I'm very much aware that I'm an old white man in a, in a community that is African American largely, uh, and ha have been for a gener for two generations now uh, in South Louisiana, covering largely African American issues uh, involving everything from climate uh, and moving, uh, you know, uh, questions about how. how uh, flooding affects their communities and why they're not getting money uh, to to petrochemical industries um, and also uh, indigenous peoples as well. We've been uh, following one indigenous community since 96. I've been writing about it um, uh, as it's attempted slowly but surely to move north um, because of climate change and, and subsidence. 
And Donald, I'll ask you the final question as a recap. How do we make these stories accessible? Well, I think the beauty is we live in a digital world. You know, before it was very one-dimensional in terms of print. Now her stories are multifaceted. It's brilliant. I, you know, I'm not restricted by pagination, you know, newsprint. Now I've got my website so I can tell stories. I can add videos, do TikToks. And so so many different layers. And that, that's been absolutely brilliant because we can reach so many different groups now. So using technology in order to reach new audiences, and that is definitely part of the future of, of how we're communicating the climate story. So thank you for your question, and thank you everyone for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference in our trees, and we hope to see you soon.